Coming from Cincinnati, this is the Spin Lob. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Spin Lob. Sitting here now, we are at Season 1, Episode 9. Uh, the uh, name of this episode is Father Knows Beth, our special guest tonight. New third time, new father, Olympian Janai Kerr, and father of cage cap goalkeepers, as well as father back in St. Louis, Tom Ray. Uh, I'm your co-host, Mike Jones, father of three, and father of the Ohio Squirrels Water Polo Club. Along my co-host here is Nick Helwig. Uh, he's also a father of three, and he is the father of his Cincinnati Marlins and Sycamore Boys. We'd like to wish a ha happy Father's Day, belated Father's Day to everyone. Uh, we hope everyone had a great day yesterday. As we know, this podcast is dedicated to Ohio water polo, but how we fit into the national scene. It's a combination of what's going on in the Ohio, the Midwest, and at the national le level. If you missed last week's episode, episode eight, you need to check in. You need to check in with that as Chad Packer, Ohio and Great Lakes head referee, uh, also a father, explains some of the new rules coming out this fall, as well as his podcast called That's a Foul, focus on refereeing and leadership. Let's turn it over to Nick and talk about some of the updates on what's going on in Ohio. So in Ohio, things are continuing to open up more and more uh, across the state. We start uh, hearing from different clubs and, and teams that are starting to get back in the pool. Um, and then actually on Thursday, uh, there is a, a big announcement uh, from the, the governor about opening up the, uh, the state for more contact. And we'll talk about it in just a minute. But uh, something else, some other big stuff happened on Thursday, and this was the uh, high school sports Ohio All-Stars uh, that came out for the Cincinnati and the Columbus area. Uh, coming out of Columbus, there were five big winners that were announced uh, by this week's sports for Central Ohio All-Stars. Uh, former UA head coach, the boys, Mike DeBear, ended up winning, uh, was, or was named the Swimming Coach of the Year for the Central Ohio area. Uh, on the water polo side, Olivia Miranda from Thomas Worthington, Worthington Kilborn, and Jeff Gear were both named uh, Water Polo Coaches of the Year out of that central region as well. I think we're having a little bit of uh, issues with Nick's um, audio. Uh, also in the Cincinnati area, Zoe Egbert, who's also plays for the Mavericks, as well as uh, Oakwood. And then uh, Princeton's Edward M. also won Cincinnati Player of the Year uh, as one of the All-Stars. Um, also this past week, we did have an interesting Zoom call together with several Ohio coaches across all levels, age group, uh, high school, and masters, where we collectively talked about our return to the pool programs. We had representatives from Columbus Water Polo, Sycamore, the Ohio Squirrels, Oakwood, uh, University of Dayton, a college club team, and then we actually had representatives from St. Louis jump on as well. Uh, we talked about reopening, some of the protocols, we're going through some of the concerns. It's a very collaborative call, so we're seeing a lot of um, really good success. Finally, uh, Thursday, the governor of Ohio did say that we are allowed to actually go back to full contact scrimmages. That can resume. But we're taking every precaution possible. You know, we're looking at what OSHA is going to come out with. We're looking at our own schools, our own clubs, our own facilities, and seeing what works. And we're taking our time. Um, even though water polo in Ohio is not formerly a member of OSHA. Uh, we still follow the guidelines very closely and keep those policies in place. So let's get going and turn it over to our special guests, Janai and Tom. Um, so once again, happy belated Father's Day. It's a very special time for both of you, especially Janai. He just had his third little, I forget, Janai, was it a little boy or a little girl? That, uh, boys. I have three boys, boys now. Oh, boys. <laughs> well, that's incredible. So congratulations. So. Uh, so Tom, also joining us from St. Louis, is the Cage Cap founder. Uh, Tom, would you mind giving us a couple minutes of your introduction, your background, and what is Cage Cap? Sure, Mike. Uh, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, I am the uh, founder and director of Cage Cap Goalkeepers. It is an organization focused uh, solely uh, on the training of the water polo goalkeeper. Um, this is going to uh, sound scary every time I say it, but uh, this August will be my 30th year uh, playing the position of water polo goalkeeper, and it's been a uh, it's been a privilege since the first day I started. Um, starting in high school, I played water polo at St. Louis University High School. I was a member of the Daisy Water Polo Club. 
then I played at Boston College for four years when that was still a Division I program uh, on the East Coast for BC. Um, and since uh, my time leaving uh, Boston College and over the last uh, five to ten years, I've been lucky enough to uh, coach in the water side-by-side -side with uh, water polo goalkeepers and coach side-by-side -side on the pool deck with coaches and coaching staffs at uh, all levels of competition um, throughout the United States, and that includes with my friend uh, Janai Kerr. So I'm excited to be here with you all, and I look forward to uh, speaking to you and, and uh, spending time with your listeners tonight. So thanks for having me. So uh, fun story on this is uh, Tom's younger brother and I played for the same high school and same club team. So we were just kind of following just a few years after Tom played. That is uh, you showing how old you are as well, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say how long ago that was, though. Awesome. And, uh, and in light of the uh, Father's Day aspect, I'm a, also a proud father of three. Three seems to be a magic number, although my kiddos are uh, a little bit older than Janai's. Yeah. And your kids are already participating in splash ball and some other events. That's exactly right. I know we're at least going to have three signed up at any registration, so that's that's a positive. You're almost halfway to a starting lineup. That's great. Actually, or, beach, or beach polo. What the other? You got Tom right. in the cage, and he has a field player, a team of field players in front of him. <laughs> so, uh, turning over to you, Janai, for those who've been living under a rock for many years, could you give a little background uh, on your career and then, of course, your growing family? Yeah, so I, I got introduced to the sport completely by accident, had no idea what it was. Um, was fortunate to play in high school for one full season under Randy Burgess. And all of my development as an athlete, water polo athlete came in college when I played for Tidmill at UC Irvine. And I was fortunate enough to get some accolades in college and move on to the senior national team. I competed for 12 years, including world championships and Olympics. During that time, I worked with not only some of the best in our own country, but um, the competition of the world is picking up and developing different styles and techniques within our own sport of water polo, but also professional athletes from other sports when it came from weight training, you know, dry land routines, um, stretching, diet, nutrition, focus and mental aspect, all, all aspects of being an elite level athlete because the higher levels that I got could not rely on my athleticism and my height more became my preparation routine and mental focus so that's what i hope to you know bring towards this call is more of a mental aspect of the game now and, and now you were able to play both field and goalie correct correct um i love the game i love the sport i try and being a student of the game and i think that throughout my career as i was learning how to play a single position, I kept learning about different, you know, perspectives and learn how to understand the game and other other positions. Um, I think most goalies love to shoot, so I've always been a great shooter. The swimming part was a little bit harder for me to get down. It took about 10 years. <laughs> but once I was able to swim and keep up at the international level, um, it was an easy transition physically because I had strong legs from being a goalie and I had studied the style of different players, so I understood the competition well um, but it's a lot different when you put into the all small nuances um you know someone like Tony Alzevedo plays five Olympics Jesse Smith will be five Olympics with an asterisk the next year for this Tokyo 2021 year coming up obviously there's some tricks of the trade that take a long time to develop but I'm I'm still learning as an athlete as a coach and just hope to continue to stay involved in this community yeah, it, it's been awesome having you come out here to run a couple of the, the camps. I know my daughter uh, hopped in, and I in last time you were out here, and she might be freezing. She loved it. Uh, we have a couple of splash balls that you, you know brought to the camp that my kids still throw around, so they, they love doing that stuff. So you might be able to see them coming up soon. Um, that's, that's one of my biggest passions about the sport. Um, not only with introduced some splash ball in the last decade, you know, water pool fours, which is going to make it more accessible for people that don't have access to pools, but just open water, whether it be lake, river, pool, beach, whatever it might be. Um, and then also, hopefully, lowering the barrier for costs so you can get a more diverse, um, <laughs> a more diverse, you know, pool of, of athletes, not only join the sport, but also being accepted into the sport. 
and nurtured so that we can actually truly get the best players in our country to be able to compete, whether it's ODP, collegially, or even all up to the national team, rather than just being focused, you know, in affluent areas within Southern California, within California, which is kind of predominantly where it's been, you know, the greatest pull for athletes for the Team USA. Yeah, and, and Tom can actually attest this a little bit too as well, um, just kind of watching the growth in St. Louis, uh, you know, blossoming. There's a, a brand new girls team starting in St. Louis, which is kind of odd to think that it's taken until 2020 to really have an all girls dedicated team to start. In, in Ohio, we, we kind of are used to that. Uh, but Tom, have you had a chance to work at all at the St. Louis Lions or their coach? You know, it's it's an exciting time, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Nick. Um, St. Louis, our region, for whatever reason, has really lagged behind when it has come to uh, accessibility for uh, girls and women's water polo. Certainly, there's always out, have been opportunities for uh, girls and women to play co-ed within uh, our area. But now the St. Louis Lion Water Polo Club uh, has uh, presented an opportunity for girls ages 12, uh, and older to play water polo in a single uh, gender setting. They are keeping costs incredibly low, uh, and they were kind enough to uh, allow me to participate in a Zoom call they had. Um, oh, I want to say it was maybe four or five days ago. And it was a call not just with their coaching staff and their board of directors, but also with uh, a large number of the players who are currently registered to play. Um, and so while they uh, certainly have a significant number of players already registered, uh, they have plenty of capacity, and I don't think there's a ceiling for that club. You know, Janai, as you talk about sort of all the different barriers um, uh, that there can be to any sport, but including water polo, I know one of the one of the areas that all clubs struggle with, but I know this is a situation that the Lions uh, face themselves in uh, finding pool time. Uh, and it's not just any pool, but it's a pool that's conducive to water polo playing. So despite some of those barriers, uh, this is a very, very exciting time if you are a female water polo player uh, in the St. Louis area, and I, I couldn't be more excited for them. And uh, I know I, on behalf of Cage Cap, look forward to helping them uh, as a club, but also as it relates to their goalkeepers in any way we can. So yeah, hopefully it put it in perspective. Um, at the turn of the 19th century, water polo was the first Olympic team sport and it took a century later um, for us, us mean the world, to add it as a women's sport in 2000 Olympics. Um, since then, the U.S. women's team has medaled every single Olympics, and they're the two-time defending gold medalists now. So once given a chance, the women have absolutely dominated. I always joke to say when, when I say, when I say when I grow up, I want to be like them and have a couple gold medals on my neck. <laughs> yeah, and we, we had some uh, very powerful women on just a couple weeks ago talking about uh, with, with Maggie and also with, uh, with Savan from Wittenberg talking about water polo on their nature. So um, we definitely love seeing, seeing how powerful they can be. Um, and Janai, I was actually listening to uh, one of your live streams the other day, and, and also it's not just women being able to get that equality of playing, but also uh, minority groups as well. Can, can you want to elaborate a, a little bit on some of the things you were talking about? I know one of the stories that struck me was that you had to change your looks um, to, I think you talked about having, you know, dreadlocks and had to change it to make it more mainstream. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Um, absolutely. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Omar and I, after 104 years, we're the first two African-American black players um, to ever play for Team USA. And going through the process, I think I was so focused on being positive and being a good role model and making the team that I didn't really feel comfortable, confident enough to make waves other than, you know, doing exactly what my coaches and my teammates asked for me. But looking back at it, I think that there's no reason why we shouldn't have had other black athletes playing prior to Omar and I, and there should have been more, I think, between now and Max Irving from UCLA, who's currently on the men's national team training for 2021. But whether it's conscious or subconsciously, we, they've, they, meaning us, um, minorities in general, black athletes, haven't fit in culturally to a predominantly white sport, male and females. Ashley Johnson 
that's absolutely dominated being the best goal in the female goal in the universe. Um, but haven't even necessarily been given those opportunities or chances on an equal basis as white counterparts. So I don't want to get into details, but it's, it exists. Um, this podcast is going to be for tips and advice for water polo training, but trust me, I'll put up some links or if you guys have put up some links from other interviews for black water polo stories from athletes, not only myself, but across the country. Absolutely. And before we kind of transition into, um, and to kind of talking about goalies and field player tips and stuff like that, is there a, a tip for coaches or players to help uh, bring more diversity and equality into, into water polo? I think you just have to focus on it the same way you do anything else. Nick and I were um, briefly talking and said, you know, the, your team is a really fast counterattack team. We well, maintain those strengths, but then you may have to focus on your front quarter, your six on five. Uh, if your team is not as diverse, well, that's something you need to make a conscious effort to, you know, really focus on. Well, one is attracting athletes of, of color um, and making people feel comfortable um, and, not, and also addressing ways to incorporate their own culture into the team. Um, you know, in business, you know, everyone that has different perspectives trying to reach that same goal or same path. But in, in athletics, sometimes that direction is so set within tradition from the year before or the generation before that it um, gets overlooked but it's something that can't be overlooked if you are truly trying to grow as an entire team. So whether it's a day, whether it's an hour, you set aside of really sitting down and focusing on what to do next. Um, and there's so many different resources, not just athletically, but just life, um, you know, just applying to life that can help any coach, any club administrator, you know, um, be more educated themselves and more sensitive and aware of inclusivity. I, I think that is fantastic advice that everyone needs to take on that. Um, and I, I think this is a good chance to now kind of transition then into some other good advice, especially for players. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll kind of Mike and I'll go back and forth and kind of ask you guys some questions to jump in. Um, and since the name of our podcast is the spin lob. I figure the first question we're going to talk about, though, is elusive lob shot. Tom, as a goalie, how can you tell if a lob shot is coming, or or what's the best way to save one? So the the lob shot, uh, you know, I'm I'm not aware of many goalkeepers of any who who like the lob shot, but the reality is it's a tool in the shooter's arsenal, and I think the real key um, when it comes to lob shots is anticipation. I think a goalkeeper, as a goalkeeper, we should be anticipating a lob shot based upon the shooter's location in the water. You know, if they're over on the wing position or they're at a lower percentage angle. I think a goalkeeper also has to anticipate a lob shot based upon where the goalkeeper's location is in the cage. Um, Janai and I talk about this all the time. You know, I'm a big advocate of goalkeepers playing aggressively out from the cages a goal line. But when you do that, uh, shooters have an opportunity um, to shoot a lob shot. I mean, for me, for me on a podcast to sort of uh, walk through the mechanics of um, sort of the five or six steps to successfully save a lob is probably a little bit difficult. But what I want to do is let me say this. Um, and I think it's important for any goalkeeper that's listening when they're thinking about the lob shot. When a shooter chooses to lob, when they choose to send the ball up in the air, they've actually given a goalkeeper a gift. And that's a gift of time. And because of that gift, we as goalkeepers must attempt to save every single lob shot. We never give up when we're trying to save that lob. And I think when you have that mentality as to anticipate uh, and then never give up on trying to save a lob shot and you couple it with um, a fundamental technique that is sort of the only type of save which requires a goalkeeper to move backwards towards the goal. Um, I think a goalkeeper is going to have a lot of success uh, to make a save on a lob shot. So then, Janai, can you counter that as a field player? What's the best way to shoot that, or when should you shoot it? Exact opposite of what, of what coach just said. Um, the goalie's out um, is part one. 
if the goalie is committed with their hands deep in the water or their hips are high on the surface. Uh, that's just you're looking at where they're positioned in relation to the, to the goal and how their body is positioned in the water. And then as far as the release, it has to look like a natural shot. I think the biggest error is people try to put too much arch on it and they end up shot putting it almost. So when they change their shot from a normal release point to bringing their elbow in front and pushing the ball up versus you see the, the best lob shot shooters are just having the base of the ball come and float off their fingertips from a natural shooting position. Um, the one thing I would say from the goalie's perspective that is um, very similar to what Tom said is the giving you time uh, because it's, I think the biggest misconception for goalies is trying to go up for the ball. Regard, it's gravity, right? What goes up must come down. So you have more time because it's not a direct shot to the corner. It's actually, cry, I say cry chop. Cry chop is slide back diagonally to the goal line rather than coming up and trying to meet the ball. Meet the ball at the lowest point as it's coming down. And any goal at any height should be able to block a lob shot. Um, again, hopefully, you know, Tom can make some little video demonstrations. Um, it backfired to me, just quick story. I think when, before Skip Shot Water Magazine was still um, changed its name, it was still Water Polo Magazine. I was on the cover, you know, describing my step-by-step -step lob technique. The next week of practice, I'd say 80% of the guys shot lobs on me almost every single shot, um, just to prove a point. But it did make me, you know, follow my own advice. And throughout my career, I can't remember a time where I ever got shot, lost, scored on more than once on a lob per game. And this is, again, I'm really following the same goal advice of being aggressive, coming out, being an extra defender for your teammates, but being aware and anticipating that there's going to be a chance you do have to slide back into the goal to block that lob. That's it. So, Janai, sticking on the same topic with goalie, um, what do you think the most important aspects of blocking just a standard shot in general? Preparation. I think 80% of the game is just being prepared. Um, an average size goalie, let's just take a six foot male goalie um, and a five foot six female goalie, is already blocking a majority of the cage if it's a straight on shot from position three if they're on the goal line. The better the goalies get at playing angles and coming out, the distance where they feel comfortable. Again, an average size goal is going to be taking away probably anywhere between 65 to 75% of the goal without even having to lunge. So as long as goalies can play the ball while it's in the air on cross passes to use that, utilize that time to slide into position, they've already, you know, if it's that house versus Vegas, they've already pretty much control that situation by being prepared for the shot before the shot's already taken. Um, that's the biggest thing I work on with goalies is being in position ahead of time because individual athletes are going to have different blocking mechanics after that. That kind of leads up to athleticism. But I would say 85% 80, of the shots are going to be shot within that 65 to 75% of that range. It's just in your quote-unquote halo. Um, and then you're going to force, you know, perfect high corner cross cage shot, or you're going to force a lob, and then you know how to react after that. So, Tom, <laughs> and I said a lot there. Anything that uh, you want to add in of coming from your cage cap expertise? Yeah, I, I you know, I am the six foot goalkeeper <laughs> that Janai is referencing. So, um, I, I agree with Janai about that preparation, and and I just add a little meat to that. That preparation. You know, what he's talking about and what we talk about all the time is that fundamental position, you know, making sure your body position's in the right spot, your hand width, your hand depth, um, uh, the quality of your egg beater, the width of your and height of your egg beater, you know, moving towards the ball, not backwards or on a plane, tracking the ball with your eyes, not just to sort of where your shoulders are, but all the way to the save. And then uh, Janai hit the nail on the head, this idea of angles and cage location and understanding how angles work and the travel of the ball. I mean, all of that goes into that preparation and that has nothing to do with the ball actually hitting your body or hitting your forearm and being directed down to the water, but that is the preparation. And if you are prepared and you are putting yourself in the right position to make the right save at the right time, uh, you're going to make more saves, more saves than not. So speaking of, of trying to, you know, get these goalies there, um, and, and we are kind of running out of time, so this will be kind of our last question for you guys to, to help us with. Um, as a coach, besides looking for your six-foot goalie or your, your, your five-six girl goalie, 
what else should a coach be looking for? What else should be a player be wanting to do if they want to become a goalie? Tom, we, we can get you and then we'll end with Janai. Sure. I, I think, I think if you're a coach looking for a goalie, you're looking for one of the best athletes on your team. Uh, the days of putting somebody who can't swim or someone who may not be the best field player in goal because it's a place where you think you can hide them. Those are long, long gone. And I'm pleased to see that uh, water polo uh, for the most part has turned the corner on that, but you're looking for someone who's not just a terrific athlete. You're looking for someone who you believe uh, mentally, physically um, in every facet of the game can play the most important position on the team. And so you know, technique, fundamental skills, uh, those sorts of things certainly can be taught, but I think there are a number of intangibles that you're looking for uh, when you're working through a team trying to select who a goalkeeper is. Um, and then the last thing that I just add to that is competitiveness. I mean, you're looking for someone who does not want to let a ball get past them, no matter what happens. And you'll start to see that the more time you spend uh, with players who you may be evaluating for the goalkeeper position, the more time that balls start coming their way, uh, you're going to start to see that. Um, I'm in no way suggesting that you should be over-specializing with the position, particularly at the younger ages. I think kids, uh, particularly young kids, should be playing all aspects of the sport and all positions of the sport. But you'll start to see kids who are kind of drawn to that cage. And once they're there, at least certainly was my experience personally, it's virtually impossible to get them out. All right, now we got uh, just a couple Hello. minutes left. Can you fill ditto. us on your thoughts too? Uh, ditto. How's that for saving time? <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> um, well, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I wish we had more time. We were actually down to five minutes before Zoom kicks us off tonight. Um, but we are already planning on goalie round two on this one. Uh, we had tons of questions left to ask you guys. Um, so I want to thank you again. Uh, any last words of advice, uh, Janai? Uh, communication, a uh, goalie that's also going to be able to communicate in a way that their teammates are going to receive it, right? It's one thing I always talk about passes. It's not, you're not trying to get there as fast and most direct pass that's going to be a bullet. It's something, you know, making a pass that your teammate can receive in a balanced position and do something with it. It's the same thing with wolves. So having a goalie that's obviously competitive, athletic, you know, aggressive, all those, athletic, all those different things can also really encourage their teammates and also at the same time not get discouraged by their teammates because there's gonna be times why don't you block that trust because there's not a goalie in the world that wants to give up a shot but field players often <laughs> don't see that as the same for some reason but it's the goal is that can always stay positive and build on that any final advice tom I, no i know you guys are short on time i just want to say thanks for having both janai and i on and Thanks for all you're doing for uh, Ohio water polo in the, the region at large. Well, we, we look so, forward to having you guys on again. Thank you so I'll much. Put, I put um, some dry land exercises specifically for goalies um, in the blog at five Um We have, you know, I, we try to contribute as much free resources as possible. Um, USA water polo has got a ton of re information out right now. Cap seven and the CWPA have the um, tip of the week. So see some stuff online. Um, it's not the same, obviously, being in person, but it's a lot better than hearing it over the radio. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. I take, take time away from your family, uh, especially right after Father's Day. We know we got back to doing all sorts of stuff that we have to do after our day off, or maybe not even day off from yesterday. So thank you guys for coming on. Um, as we get closer to the fall season, we'll start profiling players and teams and coaches uh, and breaking down the game and teams from uh, around the state, both college and high school level. Uh, if you have topics or shout outs that you want to get on about playing in college or people you want to interview, contact us at cincywaterpolo at gmail.com or Twitter on Instagram at cincywaterpolo. Spin Lab is produced and recorded live by Mike Jones and Nick Helwig. It's supported by the Ohio Squirrels Water Polo Club. You're never too old to get into the game. Go nuts. And also by Marlins Water Polo Club. For the love of the game, there's always Marlins Water Polo. Our theme music is produced by Jason Shaw at audiotix.com. See you next time on The Spin Lob.